at Essex from key account management and uh, general management programs to, to multiple other products, uh, which are also customized to those companies. Everything's available on the Essex website, uh, the Essex education, executive education website. And, you know, we can kind of talk about this. You've got my details and I think we should go into Q and A now. Uh, so let's talk about those Q and A's. Uh, we have some fantastic questions, quite a large number. So we have the first question, which is, it would be interesting to look at the regulatory constraints on innovation. So looking at this from the, fintech perspective so Viren, what do you think i mean at the moment if we look at fintech whether we look at blockchain whether we look at cryptocurrencies all these are very new areas uh and it requires regulators to catch up in some ways with some of the innovation activities so on the one hand you're at the forefront but when the regulators catch up they can constrain and, and cause all sorts of problems but how do you think companies should approach that so the thing with regulation, you got to understand, Taz, is that, uh, it, you know, if it's, if it's uh, and I'm not using the word disruption here because that's, that's a misnomer. If it's a technology-led innovation like cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, uh, it's very interesting because I had a, a person approach us yesterday uh, and they said they, they want us to do training in, in cryptocurrencies and not limited to Bitcoin, so it includes Ethereum and a few other products out there. They have a membership. It's, it's based in Siberia. I don't know why. Uh, uh, and they have a membership of about 40,000 people. And it's also, you know, a slightly new area for us. Technology-like businesses, then the regulation is always going to lag the development because the governments are much slower mm -hmm. to catch up. We've had big statements about MPs making this internet thing is not going to take off. So companies and markets will innovate much faster thing so which is why uber is getting is getting banned press much off you know much you know uh, you know way after it actually launched in a few cities and you know there's trouble in berlin paris and london now at the moment mm -hmm. but 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 you know because it takes time for jurisdiction to catch up you know what's 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 allowable and what's not allowable, what's not allowable out there you're gonna have extreme protectionism so i experienced that in oman uh where uh where taxi taxis don't even have meters forget uber Taxis don't even have meters, mm. right? Mm. And you go across the border to Qatar, and not only is Uber uh, prolific out there, the government has launched a taxi company uh, out there called, uh, called Aira, which is exactly an Uber-like company, mm. but it's completely licensed by, by the government. So there's almost an Uber competition promoted by the government, and that's out there. So you get these extreme examples. But, you know, I, I mean, you know, I think the thing about regulations is, you got to look regulations as one way of putting constraints that's going to drive future innovation. So regulations in, in CO2 emissions, regulations in this thing, you know, that's the kind of stuff that's driving um, EVs, that's driving hybrids, uh, regulations like, you know, disincentives to continue with coal and other technologies is what's going to drive, you know, uh, some of the other things or incentives on this. I think so in a, in a, it's a mix of both. There's a catch up period yeah. or you can look at it as constraints. Yeah. You know, where, where things are going to close down and, and, and it's going to happen. It's happening in, in sort of building and lots of other industries. Yeah, I, I recently read about Airbnb having problems in Mexico. Uh, and also when you look at the autonomous cars in many ways, whether you're Jaguar Land Rover, you can see, you know, if you're going to autonomous cars, then the question is, again, what happens if that platform in the car goes wrong and, and has a crash? Who who's to blame That's here, a whole, right? There's a whole legal aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there is this Magna Carta view of AI and, and and these innovations that are coming now in multiple ways. So I think, you know, very good question there from uh, Tony Bao. Yeah. Okay. So what I'll do, Taz, is that I'm going to uh, we got a couple of windows open for Q and A. So I'm, you know, let me read out the question. Sure. Yeah. Can, yeah, so. yeah. So we've got Alex next, who says, "Very fascinating discussion, gentlemen. Thank you for calling us, gentlemen. That's very nice." You mentioned innovation and operations. Do companies think about their supply chain to be more efficient? And if they do, what's your view? And I think that's with your work with the Supply Chain Academy, I'm just going to hand this question over to you. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I think without a doubt, innovation in the supply chain is happening in multiple ways, from my understanding. Uh, you know, you just have to see at the moment, it, this, this whole area of Internet of Things uh, is, is kind of, being incorporated into how some of the supply chain companies are using efficiency 
uh, to look at perishability of some products. Uh, we're seeing now companies talking about autonomous technology, uh, collaborating with auto manufacturers in, say, trucks and a very large kind of uh, kind of businesses in, in the transportation industry. So whether you're in shipping, and I recently heard about Hyundai uh, that is going into autonomous shipping, we're seeing you know many many large suppliers um, that are engaging in their supply chain activity. So they're looking across the value chain in the supply chain, where the supplier supplier uh, is is engaging with different aspects, whether it's product or process. And so there's different types of innovations that we're seeing, whether it's on the efficiency side, uh, where it's about saving money, or it's in the engagement side, which is about creating uh, opportunities to save time. And saving time means you're saving money. And so there's multiple activities happening in, in the supply chain uh, as we speak, and more work will happen in that process side, the product side. And, and in some cases, we'll see some supplier suppliers being squeezed out and, and, and directly engaging uh, in, in different ways, right? So there's, there's all sorts of shifts happening in that side of the business. So I've, I've got a couple of things to add before you go on to the next question. So you've got companies like Unilever uh, who in the supply chain are so conscious about the CSR that they build in, yes. about, right? So, yeah. so yeah. they want to procure locally uh, and consume locally. So, so they've got huge, in, and, and, and Unilever, the bigger investor, like the, 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 I think there's, there's the Stewart Group that's a big investor, they actually go to countries like Ghana and make sure that whatever they're supplying is procured, supplied, manufactured yeah. out there. So they're, you know, a large part of them in the supply chain is driven by building the economy mm -hmm. in the countries where the customers are. Some people call it sort of strategic CSR or virtuous circle. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And the other thing I think where there's a lot of work happening in supply chain innovation is in pharmaceuticals. Mm. And it's about long range prediction and production planning. So there's a lot of work that's happening in that. So I think those are the couple of areas. Yeah, and, and the circular economy yeah. aspect, which yeah. I think is very interesting because companies are now, as you said, using new materials, new raw materials to uh, basically, you know, use those materials again and again. So yeah, we see yeah, this yeah, with yeah. CIMEX and we're seeing this with recycling, uh, recycling aspects on, on, on those kinds of innovation activities. Excellent question there, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Next one, uh, another one from um, Porcus uh, is, is working with PepsiCo. He's asked, is there any common characteristics among large companies that foster an innovative culture? How can a large uh, organization deliver successful innovation? So you work for PepsiCo, and I'm gonna give an example if I go for this one. Coke set up an innovation, sort of almost a museum uh, in, its, in its headquarters in the US. I think it's in Atlanta. Atlanta yeah, 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 yeah. It's in Atlanta has done that. I've been there actually, yeah. Right, yeah. so, and uh, so, 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 so Coke is, a, is known to be a very, very uh, innovative company in that regard. But let's just step back, you know, there are, almost industry agnostic things that you can do for a large company to be innovative. So one thing is, you know, the tolerance and understanding of risk is something that you need to train people up into. And how do you look for innovative projects and how do you bootstrap them is very different from what that happens. So that's one thing. The other thing is the incentives within the organizations for innovation and how do you create the teams, the culture, the ground up uh, innovation culture. Uh, and remember uh, on the slides I talked about that there are, there are things around product champions, there are things around um, uh, incentives, internal markets. These are all techniques that companies, large companies can use to do it. One large company that does a great job of that is P&G. You know, oh, yeah. almost, almost it's, it's connect and develop a strategy. Almost 50% of its innovations come from outside, yeah. right? So it's got a lot of in open innovation platforms out there. So again, for big companies to think, you don't have to be doing everything yourself. You can pick that innovation mm -hmm. uh, from, from the outside. So there's a, uh, another concept called exponential organization, but you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's part of the process. So we'll, we'll, let's go on to the next one. I actually could just quickly to add to Yorgos. Yorgos, I think the, the, the key thing that I've noticed from my conversations with innovation directors, and funnily enough, uh, I, in my past life in KPMG, I was head of innovation uh, in corporate finance. So actually, I, I, we built an innovation ecosystem and we had a whole ideas collection process and we created a three-way gateway process. And what was interesting, you know, and I'm sure Pepsi has its approach to innovation and building the culture. But what we learned uh, in KPMG when I was there was using this idea that you ask your employees to spend some hours a day, sometimes even one day a week to think about innovation. 
And it's a difficult way of organizing yourself because, you know, for service company like KPMG to focus on that future activity is not easy. But, you know, if you create an ideas collection process, you create the business case, you monitor, you create a risk uh, accountability, who owns this, and you go through these different uh, aspects, I think we can see successful innovation in that way. Thank you, Yorgos. Good. So, right, the next question. Um, how best can you manage and sell the return on investment for innovation programs following the innovation of others can be a more cost-effective strategy? Should I take a first point? Go for it, yeah. So, <clears throat> i tell you what not to do, right? Don't try and, if it's not an incremental innovation, don't try and sell the innovation back to the finance guys as an NPV or IRR project, right? Because if it's something that's experimental and has inherent risk, your predictions are not going to be correct. They, you know, uh, they're just going to be numbers on a spreadsheet. Right? And this is why companies become innovation averse because people make commitments, the numbers don't stack up, uh, there's an expectation gap, people say it doesn't work and you know, they don't like the non-predictability. There's another science to this than the normal sort of uh, cash flow thing we do and it's called about creation of options. And this options theory is becoming more and more in mm -hmm. finance and out there is that you break the innovation down into steps and say, you know, if we reach step one, again, think pharmaceuticals that if, you know, if we can reach this level, we have reached one level and then we can have a choice whether we should go to the next level or not. So there are a number of go, no go decisions as a part of commercialization that happens. Mm -hmm. Again, a topic for um, you know, spending some time in discussing this, but that's really how, it should be sold as a series of small experiments that you can run, a series of hypotheses that you're testing, and that's how you want to do it. And yes, following innovations are there's a really cost-effective strategy. In fact, they stay in the startup world. Most ideas are borrowed from other industries, mm. right? So you've got Spin, which is a, 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 a dry cleaning service. It's called the Uber of dry cleaning, right? So you do actually, you can mm. borrow ideas and you should. A lot of those business models have been thought in other industries, and that's actually a good place to go and look for them. So I'm just going to see if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, no, I, great, great points. I agree with you, Viren. I think uh, you know measuring ROI on innovation is never easy, uh, but but it, it you know it's straightforward if you know what you're looking for. So it's really about drilling into the KPIs. So some companies are looking at patents and they count the number of patent outputs with R and D. Some people look at how is this process going to improve the customer yeah, side? So it's, it's about the customer uh, satisfaction. So you're, you're finding those KPIs to measure uh, innovation in terms of ROI, whether the customer is uh, improving uh, their, their efficient, you know, there's efficiency savings on time. So you measure time uh, savings. Uh, so it depends on what exactly is innovative here. And, and then it's about the following, you know, side of things. And I, I genuinely believe imitation should be hand in hand with innovation. And I like to call it emotation okay. because I think Im innovation and you imitation. You must patent that. Well, no, no, no. Actually, this is, this is from a, an academic who, who coined that term from uh, Ohio State. Uh, and, and he wrote a book called Copycat. And, and this academic, uh, uh, his name now escapes me, will come to me, uh, Oded Shankar. So Oded Shankar talks about this idea of copycats. And many innovations that we see out there were actually imitations, right? So the iPod came out, but actually the MP3 player was out years before that. And then whether you look at the iPad, actually the tablet was yeah, yeah. out in the 80s. So I think some they go- people, Some people think it was out during the Star Trek. Right? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. So there's all these uh, wonderful ideas out there. And, and I do agree with the point there. It can be very cost effective to, to quickly leapfrog by imitating, uh, as long as you're not jeopardizing uh, the, the kind of the copyright, right? So you have to be, walk around that. but. Companies do this very effectively. So just a couple of things I want to add to close that. So I think great question. And Taz said, you know, there are a number of ways to measure whether not to a particular project, whether the company is innovative. I'll just give you two more examples. One example is 3M. And the way 3M measures itself and is measured in the industry, yeah, uh, is, is one other, how much revenue are we getting by products that were developed three years ago, yeah? That is, that, is, that is a very, very good innovator. That goes to show how much, you know, how much innovation is happening within the company, how much they're even cannibalizing their own business. So that's a very, very strong indicator of that innovation capability. That's 3M as a company. 
And another one, if, if, your, if your strategy is to be customer intimate, right, they're, they're really, there's, there's one metric that matters more than any other metric, and that's called the net promoter score. So the one question, if you need to ask one question to your customer is, how likely are you to recommend our company to your friends and other colleagues to become customers? Is it really like a really big predictor of how you're doing, you know, how innovative you are in the customer mm -hmm. intimate space? So Taz, we've had a wonderful range of comments about uh, legacy blockers, m and activity, and yes, m and &A. a is only one innovation strategy when you're really renewing, and, and, and you know, Cisco did a great job. So I think that's it's, it's created a great amount of discussion. We pretty much handle the questions that you can. I um, can I hand it over to you for any closing thoughts. Then? Yeah. So so you know in general, thank you to you, Viren, for being Love here. Viren has uh, immense experiences on innovation activities and and is a thought leader in the field of innovation. And I would like to thank the Change School for partnering with us at University of Essex and Essex Business School. I would like to just kind of give you some final views on this program that's going to be delivered in November, uh, November 20th, 21st. It's called Accelerating Innovation Program. Please, uh, if you can attend it, please feel free to email me if you're interested. I'm always happy to take you through our content in more details. Uh, add me on LinkedIn, add me on Twitter. I would like to tell you that um, we have lots of different executive programs, not just ones on innovation. We have key account management, strategy formulation implementation, where I take you through this course called Orchestrating Competitive Advantage. Uh, we have a program that um, we're looking at. It's called a general management program, which is called the Essex Core Management Program, which focuses on finance and marketing and strategy and all the good stuff. Uh, but in general, we're open for business. Uh, executive education is growing. We're in a very interesting stage here at Essex. And I'd like to thank all of you that have attended uh, and are participants on this webinar. This is the first one of many that will come here at uh, the, the University of Essex. Thank you for your time. And I hope to hear from you uh, individually, either through email or in other ways. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Viren.